Today on Sounding Off, we have Dream Theater keyboardist Jordan Rudis. It's coming up next. Hey everybody, today on Sounding Off, our guest is Jordan Rudis. He's the keyboardist of Dream Theater, but he's played with the Dixie Dregs. He's played with Liquid Tension Experiment. It was a, a project of yours. And you've, you've done a lot of playing over the years of bands that we probably don't even know about. Sure. Well, or maybe depending on what kind of styles you're into, you know. <laughs> Jordan, can you tell me a little bit about your early music experience? I understand you have perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. And what kind of music did you listen to growing up? Sure. Well, my family wasn't really um, a big music family. Nobody were musicians in the family. My father was in the garment business. My mother was a teacher, although really liked music. My brothers, they don't have anything to do with music, although I guess they like it. Um, so really there was no music around me growing up. The way that the whole thing started was that I was in my second grade class and they had a piano there and I would play the piano. And one day the teacher just called up and said to my mother, Oh, Jordan's playing all these songs very nicely. And my mother said, what are you talking about? It's not my kid. And, uh, and then she said, well, he is, you have to, you know, know that. And, she, and about a week later, a piano appeared in my house and I started taking lessons. So, um, you know, it, the way that it started, basically, this guy who comes around once a week and teaches you for half an hour started me on the little John Thompson book. Sure. And uh, I learned a tune or two. And then he realized that I was, you know, interested in chords and finding different chords. And so he kind of abandoned that book and started to uh, just focus and teach me how to, you know, find all the different chords and the inversions. And um, so as far as listening to music, um, you know, I guess my, my first real focus was classical music. Okay. Because uh, my path went from that particular teacher onto uh, um, uh, another woman who was very uh, kind of intent on getting me into Juilliard, um, which happened about a year after I started studying with her. And then um, once I was in Juilliard, everything became extremely focused. Uh, I had to relearn everything I had learned a couple of years before that because my teacher was very particular about technique and coming from a very uh, interesting background, having herself studied with Rosina Levine, who is, of course, one of the most famous teachers of the last 100 yeah. years. So I got kind of not stuck, but caught up in this whirlwind of very intense classical study. Um, but at the same time, I was lucky enough to have a teacher that was uh, open-minded into other things and would turn me on to things like the Beatles and brought me to uh, see Tommy when I was 13 years wow. old, although no idea what it was because it was the premiere of the Who's Tommy at the, the Fillmore East. Um, I wouldn't say I was into that at that point. It was a little shocking more than anything else. But uh, what was happening uh, simultaneously with all the classical study was that I would be playing a lot of like show tunes and songs from movies because my mother, who loved music, uh, now understood that she could bring home a guitar, you know, like lead sheet kind of thing or vocal uh, notation, and I would just play it in whatever arrangement. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, so she enjoyed that, and I was always playing. And I was kind of like at Juilliard; I was the one who would bring the other students to the end of the hallway practice room so I could show them some blues or some boogie woogie or something that they, you know, would just smile about. Until you know, until the whole thing kind of like morphed to uh, the, 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 the next phase, which was, you know, when I discovered the synthesizer and when uh, people started to turn me on to progressive. Uh, rock music and some electronic music and then that's a whole nother story. So so when you got into, would you say it was in high school when you started getting into progressive music? When when would that have been? Yeah, I was exposed to my first progressive music around 17, 18 years old. The big, the big uh, transition for me in my life happened when I discovered Emerson, Lake and Palmer and somebody yeah. brought up Tarkas album. Yes. And all of a sudden I realized that there was all this power to be had, you know, with using rock as kind of like the medium to get it out there. And, and, and you could still use, you know, more interesting chords than the other rock that I had been hearing. And some of the stuff, and, and uh, what was interesting is that some of the things I was composing about the time that I heard ELP was like 
kind of like using suspended chords and like bar talk like or Aaron Copeland like a little a little bit in that vein. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my god, this is, this is amazing! You can <laughs> you can have these electronic instruments and create this power. So uh, yeah, ELP was really unique with that. I think when you started hearing synthesizers, and I was like, what is that? And I remember you'd start it, seeing it at, at stores growing up. You'd start seeing a mini Moog. Yeah, the thing that really wanted. There were two things that made me really, really want a mini Moog, and that was Rick Wakeman and his six wives, Henry yeah. Henry A, and also hearing Patrick Moraz play uh, uh, in the group Refugee, mm -hmm. soloing that he was doing back then. There's this one song called Someday. It was a ballad, but he plays a really, really great solo in the middle of it on the Moog, where he's using that pitch wheel in such a cool way, and I was like, I gotta get one of those. <laughs> it, I would put pic pictures up on my uh, bedroom wall, like little cutouts from magazines with tape, you know, like until finally, uh, I think my father convinced uh, an uncle who was uh, in a position where he could actually buy me one. He, I remember he called me into his office. He said, uh, okay, I uh, hear you really want this thing and I'm gonna get it for you. The, the, one of the proudest synthesizer syst or keyboard systems I ever had was my mini Moog an ARP string machine and yes. the Moog Taurus bass pedals. And I had those set up and I felt like I could like rule the world. How much were bands like Yes and Genesis influences on you? Uh, tremendous influences and in different ways. I mean, for Yes, the big influence, the, the influence was in the spirit of the music. It was this glorious kind of vibe. And of course, John Anderson's voice is so, he's so beautiful. I would say, musically speaking, a group like Genesis was maybe a little bit even more influential as far as harmonic yeah. uh, ideas go, because I would study. In those days, I wouldn't so much try to like learn a particular song, but I would hear the harmony and I'd be interested in what's making that sound. You know, so I would go to the piano and kind of figure out, oh, he's using like he keeps playing the same bass note and moving the triads around it. And that's kind of creating that effect. And then I would write something on my own. I had a great teacher who would always say, OK, well, if you like something, you know, write, write a piece. Or he would even assign me like, OK, this week we're going to look at the, the tritone and I want you to write something using the tritone. Or we're going to look at just half steps and dissonance and explore that. So I kind of kept that that. Uh, concept moving forward whenever I would you know hear or learn about new music if I heard something I'd go okay what is it I'd find it and then I go okay let me try to write something with that or, or I'd come up with a little exercise that you know so I could get kind of get used to where those sounds were on the keyboard so uh, it created a nice system for me to kind of expand my improvisational techniques because I'm a big improviser, but of course you need tools and you need to hear, you know, have something in your head and, and know you want to get there as far as almost like a language, you know, it's like, you, it's, it's to me, improvising is very much like speaking. Um, and maybe in some ways I'm better at sitting at the piano and just like going down a, you know, a, a communication path than I am at just speaking the English language because I've spent so much time doing it and I've you know gathered all kinds of tools and uh, and that's kind of where my my main focus has been at. So so groups so getting back to what you said so a group like Genesis so the harmonies were very important Emerson Lake and Palmer certainly with all their fourths and suspended chords and all that kind of stuff that had a huge effect as well and uh, Gentle Giant and yeah. you know all the amazing rhythms and I was always into playing Bach I always found it very kind of centering. And I always enjoyed it. And when, when I discovered Gentle Giant, that was a huge passion for me. I would follow them around, you know, wherever they were playing. And I would also, you know, kind of like learn to improvise in a Gentle Giant kind of style. And of course, they're right in that style as well. Although every time I do that in Dream Theater, they think it's, it's they say, oh, it's like a drags thing. I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> Wherever you think it comes from, that's fine. But uh, I'm a little older than they are and also a little bit more deep into Prague. Right. So, uh, but there's definitely Gentle Giant that was, uh, you know, and a combination Gentle Giant and Bach that got me into that space. Now, do you think that most people that listen to Dream Theater have any idea who's, who some of these progressive bands are? There's this, you know, there's a percentage of people. I think Dream Theater's audience is a mixture between the progressive rock fan uh, not being the biggest part, I think, actually, yeah. maybe a smaller section. Uh, and then the metal, you know, people 
who like metal. I think that's probably the, the biggest percentage of fans. And then we also have fans that, uh, you know, like younger people who want to kind of play like John Petrucci or, you know, like that look up to us as being, you know, rock musicians who can really play their instruments. So it's a whole combination. And then we, we lost and we gained some fans on our last album, um, which, of course, was kind of di dividing the group. And there was a little bit of a war going on uh, between the different factors so because it was very you know it was the astonishing was very mellow yeah uh and oh well it wasn't all mellow but it definitely had a lot of dynamic waves and it was you know it was just sometimes very sweet and i think some of the metal fans heard that and it was like what the hell is this <laughs> and other people were like wow i like this if you had played for you a dream theater record back when you were in high school and said this is the band that you're going to be in what would you have thought of it um, well, it depends when I would have heard it. If I would have already heard like Yes and Genesis and all those kind of groups, I, pro I probably would have um, really appreciated The timing was really good for when I did hear it because uh, at first I really wasn't into like the heavier uh, kind of rock. I wasn't, I wasn't into metal. But the, the metal interest happened a little bit after the prog side, especially when I started to get a little bit more rebellious. I was never like the kind of teen, I wasn't, I'd never really had like a teenage rebellion, so to speak. So I wasn't into like, you know, super heavy stuff. But at, when I got to be about 18 or so, I started to feel like, you know, a little stronger about changing my path. And that's when I discovered like, you know, Black Sabbath and uh, I don't know, Judas Priest. And, you know, I would blast that in my bedroom. So if it would have happened at that time, I would have been like, oh, well, um, but, you know, I guess I would have probably had a similar reaction to the one I had when I finally did hear Dream Theater, which was, you know, wow, these guys are doing like the prog thing. And also it's really heavy, but they can really play. That's the thing that really struck me because I'd never heard that in rock before where, where it was so tight and so clean. I was like, wow, amazing. They kind of have like a classical mindset and having just, you know, gone to Juilliard for all those years and cared about, you know, my technique with my instrument, I could relate to that. Okay, so speaking of technique, this is kind of a strange segue, but I, I follow along in your Facebook and you demonstrate a lot of, you demo a lot of different keyboards that have, you know, things that are, that roll out and they play. You are a, you're a real synthesis. You, you really like new sounds. You like to experiment with new pieces of equipment. I think it's really informative, honestly, for people that aren't able to buy things like that and check them out to actually watch your channel and see you demonstrate all these things. I think it's really mm. fascinating. I think it's a really cool thing. Why do you like doing that? I've had a company called Wisdom Music, Wisdom mm -hmm. with a Z, for about eight years now. That kind of comes from my general interest in, in sonic exploration and my passion for synthesizers years ago before my career really started to uh, get going. I was a product specialist for Korg, and then I also worked for Kurzweil. Yeah. And part of the job was to give feedback, especially in Kurzweil, about what features would be cool to try things and to make sounds on the synthesizers. So I've always been really passionate about kind of like reaching for like that next cool sound. And when I discovered the multi-touch idea, I got really into uh, ideas about how to take multi-touch and, and create new expressive ideas or new expressive ways to, to uh, create music. And uh, my first software that I released when I started my business was an application called MorphWiz, yeah. which very much kind of like told the story uh, of what I was interested in. Although if you go back to it now, it's still a really cool app. You know, the sounds are not, not the most current sounds because it was done eight years ago. But uh, as far as conceptually speaking, it was this idea of using a multi-touch surface to individually or independently have each finger kind of express the different notes. So you could, for example, play a C and on a vertical kind of throw, you could change the timbre or morph between one waveform and another while another finger was down and not morphing. And you could bend the pitch or do a vibrato on one note while you're not doing it on the other. So it's all about this kind of independent play between the fingers, which was and still is kind of cutting edge. The other thing that it offered, which the hardware world is still needing to catch up to is the idea of having visual information that's not only telling you kind of what's going on, but also providing some kind of almost like an entertainment value to sure. sort of looks really good. Yeah. So the combination of ideas was something that 
I kind of blast forward with that application, which actually won the uh, Billboard uh, number one spot for music apps that year, which was a great start. So it enabled me to kind of continue along that path. So I've been very involved, not only with my own company, and especially these days with an app called GeoShred, which is a, mm -hmm. uh, a project that I worked on with the people from Karma out, uh, in, in Stanford. That's a whole story about how I go out to the Karma Labs at Stanford University and show them new technology and hooked up with, with those guys. But, um, but I've also been involved in the, in the hardware space and people trying to make instruments that have this new kind of expression, things like the Linstrument, uh, which is a Roger Lynn design, and a lot to do with the Seaboard, which is Roly. You know, all, all kinds of stuff has come through my, my path. One of the first ones that I really fell in love with was the Continuum by Lippold Hawken. It's a great instrument. It's kind of on a flat surface with the three-dimensional kind of touch oh, yeah. where you can yeah, yeah. similar kind of thing to Morph, which is some videos of me playing it yeah. online. And uh, so this has been a real passion. I love this part of my world. Matter of fact, next year I'm going to go out to Stanford and be an artist in residence out there and hang with all the people who are thinking about creating uh, new musical you know, instruments and have all these fresh ideas and really looking forward to that as well. I don't think there's a, an equivalence in guitar or bass or other instruments that has the development in sound techniques like there is on, on keyboards now. I think there's a real, you've seen this explosion in the recording side with, with people with home DAWs and this explosion of new microphone technology, mic preamps, things like that in, in the pro audio world because of producers yeah. making records at home and people like yourself that, that will do stuff at home. But this yeah. explosion in keyboard technology because of computers is really something. Right. Yes, like I was speaking with somebody the other day where we were saying that the the um, the sounds, the sonic capabilities are so vast, it's so amazing, and we're almost playing catch up with ways to control them. So it really is that way, because you know, part, part of what's going on nowadays is you could have like your, you know, your iPhone in your pocket, and on your iPhone you could have so many incredible ways to control sound and see the sound, and whether it's bouncing balls or moving your finger to create waveforms or whatever. And then you go into a music store and it's like, oh, there's the new, you know, keyboard synthesizer. And <laughs> Boring. So people are like waiting for, you know, things to like catch up, you know. It's an interesting space that, that we're in. You know, I started out playing synthesizers on keyboards that were not weighted action just because they didn't have weighted action in those days. And then there was even a time when I was like, oh, yeah, I'll play whatever, you know, whatever keyboard. But now especially when I perform like with dream theater and it's really kind of intense and you know, I got to do my thing. I really feel like I need to have the weighted action. So it's, so if I'm getting into it, it's not like I'm just like hitting notes that I don't want to, you know, have go down. Right. Sometimes more, more energy than you know, more physical energy than usual. And it gets a little, the control factor gets, you know, more challenging. How do you find sounds that blend with distorted electric guitars? Is that always a challenge to, to find your space? Or is it a challenge for John to find his space? Or does his well, sound not change that much and you have to find well, your I, space? I, I overheard the other day, John, listening to a video where they were demonstrating this new technology which can, can effectively double, triple, quadruple your sound. Uh -huh. And he's in the studio. He always doubles everything. Anyway, he's got the sound of God, and, he, and he's doubling it. And, <laughs> you know, and now, he, now he's thinking about tripling or quadrupling, so I'm getting a little frightened. But, uh, you know, that's definitely something that I have um, spent a lot of time on over the years, and we've thought about yeah. uh, and tried to modify. You know, there's always a bit of a challenge there because I'm really into keyboard orchestration, and, uh, and I like to build colors and, you know, whether, whether it's orchestral or other or something that you've never heard before. So, yeah, that's uh, it's something that I'm very conscious of and we're very conscious of. One of the things that one of the things that comes into play a lot and people probably don't most people probably don't realize it is just the way that sounds are EQ'd. Yes. Like a lot of times if I have a like a lot of times if I'm playing a pad, for example, even if it's like a, an analog string pad, a basic sound like that, um, the first thing I'll do. Uh, before I consider anything else is I'll roll off a lot of the mushy part of the low end because really in a group context, there's no reason to have that. You don't need it's, it. It's going to create weight. So, it, you know, it's about kind of bringing out the frequencies um, that, that really matter and getting rid of the ones that you're not going to hear and it's just muddying up the mix. So that's a big part of it. Now, will you and do that? that if, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but will you do that on board on the keyboard or will you do that post with an equal, with an actual equalizer well 
as as the keyboardist and sound designer, I will offer that to you know to the to the mix when it's my turn. I'll yeah. I'll I'll do that because I'm that's part of who I am. Certainly, you know when whoever's engineering it, maybe they'll go back and continue that process when they're putting all, all the pieces together. But as a starting process, I'm not going to give somebody something that is just not in the ballpark at all. Right. So um, yeah. So then it's a matter of or orchestra. You know orchestration beyond that like okay there's a tremendous chord what's what am i really gonna put what really fits is it like an organ sound is it something like really higher than that is it something that a lot of a lot of sounds that i've developed over the years um uh, are in interesting in the sense that they give character to the heaviness they'll like blend with john's guitar and you'll hear them but you don't necessarily say oh you know that's a synthesizer you don't know what it is but it's adding this other element and it kind of makes you feel like it's just got another kind of presence to it. Like this, a sound that uh, um, has become slightly famous because of the funny name, which is the snarling pig, which is the sound that I'll call up sometimes to double lines. And it's got this kind of interesting phasing going on. And when it doubles the guitar, it sounds really cool. This is one example of the uh, kind of textures that I can add to uh, the guitar sound in Dream Theater to make it sound a little bit unique and, and have a special vibe. When you have a, a nice blend of keyboards and guitars and distorted electric guitars, it sound, makes it sound massively big. That That's the upside of it. The downside is trying to find your space because distorted electric guitars take up a lot of room. And the other part that's challenging but also sometimes rewarding is that, you know, especially for a group like Dream Theater, where we like this kind of epic sound, you know, where it just gets so big, like a song like the one, one of the ones we're playing um, live now, which is the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I'm playing, it's a huge, it's a huge keyboard sound. It's kind of like it starts out with all the strings and different octaves and piano and, but it works. You know, there are times when you could say, oh, no, it doesn't work. So a lot of it is how, obviously, what kind of an engineer we have, how, how gifted they are to make things work as well. Um, because I've done albums with Dream Theater years ago where I've played what I thought were some really fantastic keyboard sounds. And they end up sounding like that, you know. Like the, <laughs> and go, what happened to my sound? It was so incredible. And now it sounds like a toy, you know. So there is that. Are there certain types of sounds that, that you know that are go-to sounds for doubling guitar lines? What characteristics do those have? Well, I've become very sensitive to distortion over the years, hanging out with uh, Mr. Petrucci um, and just, you know, enjoying harder kind of driving music as well and so I spend a lot of time uh, crafting my sounds as far as the way the nature of the distortion uh, as an example um, one story is that I was in the studio forget which album maybe systematic chaos and John was working on this crazy his amps were like in another room but they were so loud I couldn't like <laughs> avoid them and I was working with headphones usual keyboard story right he's yeah, blasting sitting there with the headphones. But um, I started to work, I was working on something very delicate and nice and I just gave up on that because there's no chance. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll try to like, like go for like the nature of the distortion that he's getting. So I was on a Roland Phantom at the time and Roland has great, you know, effects. And yes. They do wonderful modeling and per perhaps some of the best in the business as far as the way that they deal with with uh, distortions and things like that so um i was able to dial in this really really cool like organ sound i really thought it was amazing and we were working on a cover of a crimson song it was maybe like, like what was it lark's tongue and aspic something i don't know a dream theater fan will remember better than me but we ended up using it on on a recording that we did and it sounded amazing we put the organ sound that i worked on on one side and the guitar sound on the other and it was awesome and i've used it like um, dark eternal night in the chorus part of it where i'm playing this kind of organ sound and it's it's really it's got the right kind of grunge where you say well that's cool you know because there's a fine line where you could have distortion and it's like oh, i don't know about that you know but then there's the other side, we go, wow, it's resonant, it's cool, it's warm, but it's still, you know, really, really driving. That's that's what I'm always looking for in whatever sound I, I create. So I have a, literally a bank of sounds that are all different, but have that kind of coolness factor about it that I can call upon uh, and use uh, when it's appropriate.
Okay, so I asked John what was in his in-ears mix, and he said that it's pretty much guitar. And I said, well, if you and Jordan are doing some of these crazy back and forth dual yeah. leads, and right. he says, well, I just I just trust that, that we're both playing the right thing at the same time. And I was yeah. saying, and I thought to myself, I wonder if I asked Jordan if you have John in your mix, in your in-ear mix. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the keyboardist, kind of like, you know, in every sense of the word. And keyboardists are known for, like, creating patches and working with sound in a different kind of way. And I think that I, it's very safe to say that if you heard my mix, it would probably be the most enjoyable band mix. <laughs> That's what has, he said. Uh, it has everybody in it. And, you know, yeah. I, I use the guitar really as a, as a guide. You know, I want to hear it. I want to feel it in, in, in a rock band without any guitar. It doesn't sound right. Right. So, um, you know, I, my mix is my mix is probably very similar to the album, except for two things. The keyboard's a little louder. Yeah. Not, not not much louder. It's just on top of you know a little bit on top, so I can tell what's going. I can hear if the Leslie is going fast or slow or that kind of thing. So I'm really uh, aware of that. And also the vocals are lower. And and what my um, keyboard tech does he's got a little mixer on the side since i'm hyper sound sensitive and he's always you know doing little things but from the most part what he does is if there's the part where there's like a vocal and piano i want to hear james breathe sure because i grew up part of what i used to enjoy doing what i still do is i'm an accompanist so if i if i I want to hear him breathe and I want to follow the musical flow of what's going on. And there are times, even though a lot of what we're doing these days uh, is to a click track, there are times where I'll pull that out of there. Like uh, an example of being at the end of the song, Surrounded, where it's just James and I, or Wait for Sleep. And I'm like, no click, there's no click track here. <laughs> you know? It's time to be musical. So I, you know, I come from a classical background and, and if I don't hear the singer breathe, then I don't, it's not to me, it's, it goes against everything that I think is music. So I would say that John and I have a little bit of a different concept uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, what we hear. But I will say this uh, as well, which is that often enough, we play places where the acoustics are so crappy. Instead, even though you're wearing the in-ear monitors, the sound is so loud and you're in back of them and you get this roar that's for me, incredibly difficult to deal with because it'll be loud on its own. Even if I have the volume off in my in-ears, I still hear the sound so obnoxious. Yeah. And then if I turn it up to hear the real sound, I'm just in trouble because it's already too loud and too obnoxious sounding and there's nothing really I can do so I'm screwed. Yeah. But in John Petrucci's world, he's got his amps, he has tolerance for volumes that I could never even dream of tolerating and he just surrounds himself with this massive guitar and it, and I'm sure he'll be deaf one day soon but at the same time <laughs> but at the same time he's you know covered with his his guitar sound is so present it doesn't matter where you are he's always he's always pretty happy and that's not even an option for me it's it's interesting do you find that you get less sound tolerant as you as you get as you get older maybe in some ways not because i'm sure my my little dip is <laughs> increasing as i hang out with these guys which is sad because you have to have it on some yeah. level of loudness even to get beyond the roar yeah. in most cases but i've always been very hypersensitive to sound like if there's a little squeak going on in the room or whatever i'm like oh you know like i just have that uh, had that issue with sound but it's also i guess a good thing but yeah it makes it hard to be in a rock band with changing acoustics it really does when you're playing a gig and you've got all these different sounds you're using and you're on click do you have midi sound changes that you that you're using that actually will change your sounds from song to song you know, uh, no, I have a, well, the way I do it is I, first of all, I have everything very focused on my core Kronos that's in front of me. I've always been kind of, for years, been into doing as much as I can with one powerful yeah. Yeah. Uh, keyboard. And nowadays, of course, it's much more possible to do it right than it was before because now I can, now my keyboard has the ability to have these big layers and sounds with reverbs or echoes. And when I change sounds, everything remains. It's almost like there are two synthesizers in the box that do the double the, the, the power is like I have a mixture of strings going through reverb, organ going through distortion, and an effect, hit it, hold it, change sounds, and then hit a very lovely, you know, boys choir sound, right. whatever, nothing gets interrupted, which is was not the case before the Kronos arrived, the quirk Kronos arrived. So what I do is I, I 
create my whole set by having sounds linearly go from, you know, one to wherever, 800, there's hundreds of sounds in a Dream Theater set. And then I have a little uh, uh, pedal, a little FS5U, I think it is, Boss pedal, that I just click on. And what's cool is that, you know, the keyboards have improved, but also like when I was using the Oasis, which was the chord keyboard before the Kronos, it had a little kind of glitchy thing where every now and then I'd hit the pedal and we'd go twice. Oh. And I would always report that to them, like, it's not, That's not, it's cool. not consistent. And now it's totally consistent. Now, I was going to ask you if, um, do you have any nightmare stories that happened on gigs o over these years as synthesizers were developing and the patch changes and then you'd incorporate, you know, multiple keyboards or there, there must have been glitchy, some, you must have some great glitchy stories where yeah. complete well, disasters. Yeah, great, great now, right, But because they're good stories, but horrible when they happen kind right. of thing. So usually the way they work. Well, there was one show early on, I was using K2500 Kurzweil racks. And of course, you know, it was, it was very complicated to get ready for a show because Mike Portnoy would always want to have a different set list every day. <laughs> so, and I had technology where it wasn't that easy to change it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a lot of samples that needed to be loaded and it was really, really a problem. I would be sweating on the side of the stage trying to cram all the samples in into whatever order of songs that he had and using these old disc drives and everything and but one time so we were on stage it was in france and about halfway through the show i got to we got to like a, a different section of what we were doing and i realized there was some kind of weird distortion going on every time i played a note and it was there was the, the sample ram had loaded badly all these particular this particular bank of sounds everything was crapping out it was all grungy we couldn't stop right and i couldn't not play and so i just wanted <laughs> to disappear i wanted to leave the planet earth i didn't know what to do and if i and the reloading time would have taken like forever to do that because i was you know again yeah. like on the side of the stage cramming all this stuff so i didn't really have it that was one of the worst things but actually one of the craziest stories was i was just um i was out with um i think it was liquid tension yeah we were doing some shows with a liquid tension experiment and i was really excited about this new roland phantom and i was working a bit with roland in those days and they had gotten me a um uh, a pre-release version of the phantom that's what i had developed everything on so all right, so we took this thing on tour. We, I was doing a show in Chicago, and I'm playing, and playing along, and all of a sudden, I hear this god-awful sound. It's like John Petrucci is playing in half steps with me. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm looking down at my keyboard, and, I, and then I let go. And I went, wait, he's not playing in half steps. He's playing the right thing. And then I put my hand down again, and I'm playing, and I go, what is that? And I heard my sound in the, in the correct pitch, but I also heard this other thing. And I realized that everything that I played was in half steps. Oh, no. a C, it was sounding a C and a B. Every oh, note that no. I played was literally in half steps. It was unbelievable. So I stopped and I signaled to the guys, go on. And I went to the back uh, alley of this club and I called and I ended up getting on the phone with Japan and the engineers to try to figure out what was going on with my keyboard. And then I, while they were playing, During I went the on. During the gig. Yeah, in a gig. I went on and I did a, I turned power cycled. I did a soft reset. I did everything, went back on the phone with them. Finally, I determined there was nothing that I could do. Uh, and I went over to John Petrucci and he was in the middle of playing some crazy riff. And I just tapped him and he looked up like, what? And I said, Give, let me play the guitar and you go play one of the other instruments so he went over and tony levin went on stick and john was playing bass and we ended up having a jam i think it might be on youtube somewhere but we ended up having a jam I where i was playing this. guitar and i just i just you know abandoned the keyboard there was nothing that i or me or my tech was going to be able to do it turned out that the that the strip that tracks the key position and gives directions to the sound engine part of it had slid like in the middle between two notes so every time I played a note, I was hearing, you know, we were hearing two notes. It was literally triggering two notes. It was, it was definitely one of the worst. So in and retrospect, funny. those are always very funny, even though in the, at the time it's, it's horrifying. Yep. Yes. It was totally horrifying, but funny now. 
How much time do you spend practicing or working on sounds outside of when you're on tour? Do you have any time to do that? Uh, well, I have a nice little Privia Casio keyboard backstage uh, that I can always warm up on or practice or improvise or get ready. And I, I definitely do that. There's no set amount of time to do that. The most important thing when I'm actually out here uh, is to, before I go on stage, is to be loose, relaxed, and hopefully maybe my hands can even be warm if it's a reasonable uh, climate in the place we're playing, which more often than not, it's not that way. Right. Um, but I try my best to stretch out and to relax. And, you know, I can practice all day long. And if I go and it's like really freezing cold and if it's tense or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and on the other side, if my hands are warm and I'm relaxed, I can have not played or practiced all day. I walk on, I'm relaxed, I'm warm, I'm, you know, doing fine. So, uh, but the practicing comes into play mostly when I'm trying to learn, uh, you know, something that just needs to be, to be spent time on to get down. Like in the, in the time before I came on tour with Dream Theater, this time I was preparing for this solo concert thing that I've started to do, which I called from Bach to Rock. And I was revisiting and learning some new classical music. So uh, as an example, I was playing um, the Chopin G minor ballad, and there's some parts in there that, you know, just, even if I'm loose and relaxed, it ain't just coming back like that. Right. It takes focus and time, and it's just a matter of time, you know, shedding and, and spending the time and practicing it slowly and slowly building up, and finally the hands and the brain coordinate, cooperate, and then things can happen. So I was practicing a lot in that break, doing my box stuff and Moskovsky and all this, you know, kind of fun stuff. So that, that was probably the most intense practice I've done in a long time, which I really enjoyed because I felt like instead of just keeping kind of like on the same level and maintaining what I have, I was actually able to notch it up a bit. And I'm going to do some more of that also when, uh, in the next uh, chapter, is to put some more time into uh, this solo uh, concert stuff where I'm taking people on a bit of a journey. These, these past ones and some more of them will definitely be just acoustic. I just had a beautiful Steinway piano at the wow. venues and was able to, uh, you know, go for the full ride, start with Bach, somehow go into some show tune, into an improvisation, into a dream theater song, into a Jordan piece, and, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's really Did, rewarding. Is there anything that, that people would be surprised that you like to listen to? Well, certainly, since I like to listen to all different kinds of music, the fans in the different areas would be surprised, like if they knew that I love to listen to like Square Pusher or Apex Twin, or you know, when John puts on some kind of a Django guitar thing, and I'm like, wow, this is awesome, you know, or I, I love, uh, you know, like moody stuff like Sigur Rose, yeah. or uh, yeah. you know, I'm just that's some of my favorite music. I like, I like, I generally like to listen to things that are calmer, spacier, more mellow. You know, things like maybe Tangerine Dream. I'll go back to the Phaedra album and, and, and listen to that. So I think I think fans have a fantasy that I'm probably like listening to like Symphony X or something like that. You know, right. if they're like dream theater fans into the metal prog. And I'm getting, you know, people are always sending me their prog metal. And, you know, that's, you know, I hate to say it because it probably disappoint some people. It's like the last thing that I want to listen to. <laughs> uh, I'd rather listen to, you know, Boards of Canada and uh, Stephen Wilson's music rather than, uh, you know, another prog metal thing. Do you see yourself going on and doing even more orchestral music in the future? Uh, yeah, yeah, I love that. I'll definitely, definitely want to do that. There's an, uh, uh, a fellow who I've become quite friendly with in Germany, a musicologist who has some connections to one of the city orchestras in Germany as an example, and he's organizing uh, something where I could write an original, another original kind of orchestral piece, and I can go there and perform it. So that that's definitely in the in the in the plan. Is that something that you really like and look forward to doing things like that? I love that. Yeah, definitely. Right. When I did the explorations project, it was really it was a great use of my, you know, time and energy and talent. I think it was it was great to be able. It felt like a really great combination of the you know of my. I've always been. Um, well, interested or I guess easy about combining the different styles. It's not something I think about. It's just mm -hmm. kind of who I am. And and having it having it also include the orchestral element was especially fun because I could go and bring in some of the Prokofiev, you know, Bartok influences to my Prague thing and 
and that and that just was just felt right. Who are some of the the pianists? Do you have any classical pianists that you like to listen to? Um, I used to like listening to like Ashkenazi play the piano and Gilels and Horowitz, of course. And when I went back and I started to do, uh, you know, get into the classical thing again, I was going and studying Horowitz, who I just think was so amazing, just so fluid, natural, you know, just incredible. Rubinstein, the classics. How much longer are you on the sewer over in Europe? So uh, I think we're here for another, a little over a week. And then, uh, and then we get home. And then in June, I'm doing uh, something that I actually did last summer as well, which is called KeyFest. KeyFest is, uh, I like to think of it as like the ultimate gathering of uh, keyboardists slash technology people. Uh, it's on June 19th to 23rd. It's just a, we're going to have uh, Adam Holtzman there who plays with like, Stephen Wilson and who played with Miles yeah. Davis years yeah. ago. And uh, Tom Brislin, who's a wonderful musician, played with Yes and Renaissance and Meatloaf, and he'll be hanging out. And my friend uh, S S Steve from Mac Pro Video, Steve Horlick, who's going to be there with his Buchla synthesizer, teaching people about modular synthesizers. And I think Jack Hotop's coming from Chord to talk about sound programming. It should be really, that really That sounds fun. It's going to be really, really fun. It's fun to get, you know, keyboardists are not used to gathering. It's a whole, it's like, it, take, it takes effort to get them to, uh, to come out and, and be social. Because, you know, you think about a keyboard magazine and it's like, you, what do you look at on the cover? You're looking at like knobs or something. <laughs> it's not like the drummer guitar world, which, you know, for me is, is a little bit sad because, uh, you know, when we do get together, it's, it's great to be able to share and talk. And I always think of it more personally. And that's not all about like the gear, but it's definitely effort to, uh, to get people out of their shell, to get keyboardists to, to be like that, to think like that. Because, you know, the art of playing keyboards is a completely different thing than the sure. art of playing the guitar. I mean, John plays me, you know, stuff that he's tracking, following by players that are taking the guitar and bringing it to these levels where we never thought it could go. Sure. You know, like uh, our friend Jason Richardson, who's like shredding like an absolute madman. Like, what the hell is going on there? Sure. Like, nobody plays the guitar. Like, Oh, there are people who play it like that these days. But, you know pretty incredible. You think about the art of the keyboard and where that's gone is, yes, there are incredible keyboard players, but it's not the same evolution. No. If you can play Hungarian Rhapsody by list, it's pretty much guaranteed you're going to be able to play whatever rock thing, you know, is in front of you or that you can think of because the keyboard itself has so, been so developed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Franz Liszt, Beethoven, all the great classical composers that were keyboardists yeah. had unbelievable technique. And Horowitz and Rubinstein, people like that would be, they reached the pinnacle of technique. Right, right. But somehow on the guitar, it's like a newer instrument or the electric guitar. It's just still kind of like evolving. It's fascinating for me to see. Because, you know, our worlds are so different. First of yeah. all, the guitar world is, you know, in the rock space is, is, is vibrant in the way that, it's, you know, the keyboard world is just not, as I was just describing. And, not, and, and certainly I am passionate and, you know, I love what I do. I wouldn't change it for the world. It's a little frustrating to have to be in a world that, you know, and so close to like John, who, who I see the way that world works. And I can't help but feel like, wow, it would be so great if like the keyboard world was a little bit you know, had that kind of like energy about it. Although it has all the sounds. I mean, keyboard is where all the sound development is gone. It's yeah. all, it's that that's, and, and every record is made with keyboards now for the most part. But yes, and nobody realized, it's not, it's kind of un, unsung. Right. Like, you know, again, like I'll play on a Dream Theater record and unless I'm playing a piano or an organ, they, people don't even know it's keyboards. They think, oh, maybe that's the or that's an or they brought in orchestral musicians, <laughs> or maybe that's an effect. Or they don't know. They don't have any. The keyboardist has to be completely devoid of ego, because even when I did like uh, you know a lot of the work I did on the astonishing was I I prepared all these you know glorious orchestral colors that basically the album was sounding really really great when we gave it to the orchestrator because John and I we wanted to hear it we wanted to you know we at first I thought oh I'll just do it on piano we'll write the music we'll hand it to, to to David the orchestrator and then he'll just take it but we were like okay what are the French horns going to be like ah oh, I better write the part you know okay what about the strings all right I'll put the strings down <laughs> oh the voice choir yes I have a voice choir sound so but again when the album came out it, a lot of it was replaced and some of it wasn't and for those things that weren't, I mean, I'm like going, oh, I made the voice <laughs> choir. You know, like no, it's not the way it works. You know, it's kind of like it's you got to just, okay. 
here it is. It's interesting because the few film scores that I've, um, film composers that I've interviewed, there's so much blending of synthesized uh, virtual instruments with orchestral sounds in movies because, you know, I say, you know, basses, you can have an extension on, on, on a double bass that can go down to a C, but when you play it, it just kind of farts out and sure. and that you hear this right. glorious sound live and i say how much doubling is is in there and they say oh they right. do it all the time you know they always are blending that in oh yeah totally and right and there were places where like you know i have this friend kurt ader who makes these incredible sound libraries and recorded like you know 50 double bass players like attacking their <laughs> instrument and i would like put that sound in my kind of pre-orchestration for the astonishing and and uh, it was kind of like, well, there's nothing really going to make that sound, <laughs> right. you know, in the, in the orchestral world. So, let's, you know, David Campbell would be like, let's just, you, you just we'll mix that in because right. it's cool. Yeah. So it makes total sense, you know, to those of us who have been working with synthesizers. And now to somebody else who is a purist, they might say, what do you mean you're going to use the synthesizer? But that's what you do because there are people making these incredible, you know, sounds with huge orchestras. Yeah. Massive of people and not to mention you could always double it triple it mix you know uh, samples together and just come up with things colors that are just you know humongous and bigger than life yeah am i correct in, in saying that the video that john has been playing for people with the young person like picking out like every possible note that's my son dylan cluster, that's insane that's just so, so crazy that he can do that i don't even understand like i have perfect pitch and it's pretty good but i can't do that if you rolled the chord, I could tell you in a second what it was. But if you just literally go like that on a million notes, it's very confusing to hear. So he must have something in his brain that is just able to sort that out, which I find fascinating. I played really complex modern classical and modern jazz improvisations for him when he was in utero. I did that yeah. through her entire pregnancy. And then every day till, from the time he was born till he was two, I would interact with him all the time. Dance around with him, play with him, sing to him, and then... You're so lucky. I wish I had that. People wonder when you have an, an ear like that, yeah. you know, that what do you do? What do you do? Like what happens? He doesn't. Right? What's interesting is that he doesn't ever think of the notes when he's listening to music. It never occurs to him. He can just listen. And I said, yes. Dylan, do, do you think of that? No, I never. They never. Only when you ask me what they are, do I think of them. That's interesting. Yeah. And I Sometimes when I listen to music, I feel like there's a quick processor going on where I just, I know what all the notes are, but it doesn't necessarily interfere with the experience, but I'm definitely, You're definitely you know, aware, right? absorbing the information from it. It's almost like, for me, it's a, the, the good part about Perfect Pitch has always been, I've been able to, it's almost like, okay, you go to the, you know, uh, read through all the prelude and fugues and you get a lot of musical information from it. And you, you know, the, you, there's so much you can learn by just being able to read music. I feel bad for people who can't, uh, in that yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. And then, I, then also, I feel like I have an advantage of being able to hear things and know what it is. So if I want to go back to that sound, I can. I got the information. I know it. Nobody has to teach it to me and show me. Oh, if you want to make this sound, then you have to do this. You know, this kind yeah. of theory, whatever. But I got it from what I heard. I went, oh, that's cool, and I'm just playing this combination. So it's been a way to, to gather musical information so I could quickly add it to my stylistic kind of like blending. One funny thing is that uh, with the Dream Theater stuff that we're doing now is that we're applying all of images and words and change of seasons yeah. down half. So I told the guys, I said, this could very well, you might have to pay for like therapy for me. I'm going to do this because I played those songs so many times in the key of the song sure. that I I made the decision to just tune my keyboard a half step lower, transpose it and keep playing. But if I think about it too much when I'm doing it, I start getting like, oh, my God, don't think about it. Don't think about it. <laughs> I, can kind of I can kind of convince myself that it's OK. But what gets me is every time a song starts, yeah. like when we start the second half, when we go into Pull Me Under and John plays, I jump. Because I think, oh my God, it's the wrong note. Sure. And I go, oh, okay, you know. And I got to kind of ease into this other reality. Well, Jordan, I really appreciate you doing this today. It's really a pleasure to meet you. Oh, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to meet you too. I'd like to once again thank Jordan for being my guest today and remind you to please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel and hit the notification button to let you know when new videos are coming out. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.